Movie footage used in the Kill Count is owned entirely by the copyright holders. Dead Meat makes no claim of ownership and simply uses the footage for purposes of education, commentary, and criticism under fair use. Please support filmmakers and the art of filmmaking by watching Jurassic Park in its entirety on home media or streaming services where available. <laughs> Welcome to The Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and today we're cracking open a dinosaur egg and starting the Jurassic Park franchise. Not horror, you say? Well, it's at least horror adjacent, dog. There are dinosaurs eating people, what more do you want? When Jurassic Park was released in 1993, it changed movies forever. It was the highest grossing film in the world until Titanic beat it out, and it spawned a series of sequels, including the recently released Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom, which, judging by its box office take, you've probably already seen. With Jurassic Park, director Steven Spielberg set out to depict dinosaurs in a scientifically accurate way, inspired by the hard science fiction of the source material, the novel by Michael Crichton. He used a combination of effects to bring the dinosaurs to the big screen. First, the animatronics done by Stan Winston, who also designed the Terminator, the Predator, and Edward's friggin' scissor hands. And second, the revolutionary CGI done by George Lucas's Industrial Light and Magic. Together, these effects made dinosaurs feel truly alive again, and Jurassic Park quickly became a multimedia juggernaut, with countless comic books, action figures, video games, games, and theme park rides. On a personal note, Jurassic Park was one of my earliest obsessions in life. This is a very important series to me, so I'm excited as hell to cover it on this channel. So please, won't you join me for the kills? The movie begins with bona fide badass Robert Muldoon supervising the delivery of a metal crate to his crew of Jurassic Park employees on Isla Nublar. Inside the crate is a scary sounding velociraptor, but the crew overcomes their fears and lines it up to an entry gate. Gatekeeper Joffrey climbs on top to lift the barrier and let the raptor inside its pen, but the velocibastard inside slams against the opposite side of the crate instead, knocking it back and allowing the dinosaur to grab a piece of that sweet gatekeeper meat. A panic ensues and Muldoon encourages everyone to exercise their second amendment rights on the dino. Shoot her! Shoot her! But Joffrey's life slips through Muldoon's fingers, and with a very vocal death gasp, he becomes the first to go on our count. Velociraptors are much less scary when they just bone, so let's visit the Badlands near Snakewater, Montana, where doctors Alan Grant and Ellie Sattler are digging up up bones, dig it? They just found a pretty nice raptor specimen, and Grant takes the opportunity to tell the audience that dinosaurs aren't actually lizards like previously believed. Instead, bird is the word. He's interrupted by a snarky little wit Hurtford, the dream child himself, saying that the raptor looks like a big old turkey. Grant don't like that kind of disrespect, so he pulls a blade on a bitch to send that kid home with one very full pair of underpants. It's clear that Grant doesn't like kids, even though his romantic partner Dr. Sattler would like to have some eventually. Fun fact, there's a 20 year age gap between the then 26 year old Laura Dern and the then 46 year old Sam Neill. Kinda weird, but I guess he is Sam Neill. Inside their trailer, Grant finds the benefactor of their digs, Dr. John Hammond, who pops champagne. Hammond is played by the late Richard Attenborough, who gives an incredible performance performance like, well, everyone else in this movie. When it came to casting, they spared no expense. Hammond needs Grant, a paleontologist, and Sattler, a paleobotanist, to come to the park he's hoping to open next year and sign off on it being safe. See, the family of the unfortunate Joffrey filed a lawsuit against the park, scaring the park's investors, who are represented by lawyer Donald Gennaro, this dude with the same tailor as David Byrne. Gennaro is going around inspecting every level of the park to ensure its safety, and Hammond needs Grant and Sattler to come and vouch for him. Although they're reluctant to go at first, Hammond persuades the paleo scientists by saying he'll provide three years worth of funding for their dig. You dig? They're flown to the island on a helicopter where we meet the greatest character ever, Dr. Ian Malcolm. <laughs> <laughs> Malcolm is played by Jeff Goldblum, a man who sweats sex appeal out of every pore, and he's a chaotician slash knee squeezer extraordinaire who's also there to evaluate the safety of the park at the behest of the lawyer Gennaro. As can be expected by Jeff Goldblum, he immediately begins hitting on Dr. Sattler. Dr. Sattler, I, I refuse to believe that you aren't familiar with the concept of attraction. They arrive at the island, and during the chopper's descent, the ride gets a little bumpy. There's a clever girl metaphor when Grant has a defected seatbelt with two female ends to it, but still, uh, fine a way to buckle them. As they take a couple of Jurassic Park jeeps through the island, Gennaro tells Hammond that he has 48 hours to convince him of the park's safety. Hammond's like, hey, yeah, that's great and all, but uh, check out these dinosaurs, motherfucker! It's... It's a dinosaur. You goddamn right, Grant. That right there is a Brachiosaurus, and she's a hungry, hungry girl. Mmm, get those leaves, a big old dinosaur. And in case you want to see some carnivores, don't you worry. They have a T-Rex. Grant's gonna need a fainting lounge after hearing about that, as Hammond delivers the film's most iconic line. Welcome to Jurassic Park. 
Fuck, I love this movie! Hammond takes them all to the visitor center and shows them a video meant to explain the science behind Jurassic Park. It features a cartoon character named Mr. DNA, voiced by Greg Burson, who forever influenced my pronunciation of the word dinosaur. Dinosaurs? Dinosaur. 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 To bring dinosaurs back to life, amber is the color of their energy, because they got that dino DNA from mosquitoes and fossilized tree sap. Then they use frog DNA to fill in any holes in the genetic code, because they know that nothing bad has ever come from cheap patchwork to hide mistakes. The team heads into a lab to see what's on the slab, and there to give some more dino exposition is Dr. Henry Wu, played by B.D. Wong, looking just as young here as these dinosaur fetuses waiting to hatch. Grant and company get to witness the birth of a velociraptor who just needs to push, push her way out of this egg. Dr. Wu assures the visitors that their dinosaurs can't breed in the wild because they're all engineered to be females. That's right, no dino dongs allowed on Isla Nublar. Malcolm doesn't buy it and expresses his belief in chaos, saying these dinos will find a way to breed regardless. Life uh, finds a way. Aw, oh, but Malcolm, didn't you hear Dr. Henry Wu? He said that they can't. And he's such a nice young man, you can surely trust him. I'm sure he'd never become a super villain like character later in the series or anything. During a luncheon that looks smokier than a casino, Hammond's guests express their views about the park. Gennaro's all about them dollar signs, while Malcolm thinks Hammond isn't responsible enough to be wielding this kind of science. Yeah, but your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could, they didn't stop to think if they should. The paleo scientists agree with Malcolm that it's unwise to engage in this kind of reverse extinction engineering, and Hammond laments that his only ally at the table is a vampire. Seems like a good time to develop Grant's character a little bit, so let's get some kids up in this bitch. Hammond's grandchildren Lexi and Tim fall into the old man's arms, and their excitement is positively contagious to Grant. They're here to join the park's visitors on a guided tour in these super modern electric jeeps with exciting features like interactive CD-ROMs. Lexi's pumped, and you know what? I get it. You ever buy one of those enhanced CDs in the 90s like Born on a Pirate Ship? That shit was dope! Hammond, meanwhile, is staying back in the control room, which, like, doesn't speak very highly of your tour if you don't even want to go on it, does it, my dude? Head engineer Ray Arnold, played by professional yeller Sam Jackson, starts up the Jeeps and the tour gets underway. An awesome giant gate opens and then we're in Jurassic Park, bitches! Too bad the tour is kind of a bust. The first dinosaur they're supposed to see, a Dilophosaurus, is more like a Dilaphosaurus because it never shows up like it's supposed to. And the T-Rex is also a no-show, even after they offer her free apps in the form of a billy goat. And that's not the only problem for the control room peeps. There's also an impending tropical storm on its way to the island, and their chief technician, Dennis Nedry, is a slovenly egotist who blames Hammond for his current financial woes. That's why earlier in the movie, we saw him visiting San Jose to engage in a little bit of corporate espionage with- Oh, holy shit, is that Dodson? Dodson! Dodson! We've got Dodson here! Wow, it is! Nobody cares. I care, Newman. Dodson gave Nedry everything he'll need to smuggle dino DNA off the island, so by the time we re-meet him in the control room, we already know that he's Barba sold out to Hammond's corporate adversaries. During their dino downtime, Malcolm flirts with Ellie and gets her all wet. Her, her hand. He gets her hand all wet, with a little demonstration of chaos using water droplets. Grant can't take the smell of all that sex appeal, so he bails out of the Jeep, and Ellie chases after him to apologize for falling in love with Jeff Goldblum so fast. Joke's on y'all, though. This just further proves Malcolm's theory. See, here I am now by myself, uh, uh, talking to myself. That's, that's chaos theory. The real reason Grant tucked and rolled is because he saw a Triceratops yonder, which was his favorite dinosaur as a kid. Solid choice, Grant. It's like the warrior monk of dinosaurs. Aw, poor girl has a tummy ache. But you know what? She should be fine as long as no humans lean on her stomach while she's trying to breathe. Oh, come on, Grant! Touch with your eyes only! Ellie takes great interest in the dinosaur's health, while Malcolm has a brief glimpse into the future, where he sees the rest of the Jurassic Park series. That is one big pile. Oh, some of them have their moments, Ian. With Chekhov's storm about to land, everyone is called back to the jeeps, except for Ellie, who opts to stay with the sick dino instead. With the storm pounding Nedry's getaway ship, it's go time for his dino heist. So he very smoothly and not sweatily at all tells the others that he's debugging the system, then sneaks into the dino blood storage freezer and adds a bunch of specimens to a shaving kit. Part of Nedry's plan takes him through the park on his way out, and that's why he set all the electric fences to turn off. The better to push them open and not die. When Arnold tries to break through his code, he runs into one of those you are an idiot type pop-ups. Uh, uh, uh. Magic word. Nedry's cyber attack has also left the phones out of service and the jeep's broken down, right next to that soggy goat meat in the T-Rex pen. Tim finds some night vision goggles that he wants so bad, babe, even though his use of them is driving Gennaro mad. Tim doesn't need those goggles to hear some heavy footsteps approaching, though, nor to notice some spooky ripples in a cup of water, an effect achieved by plucking a guitar string underneath the cup. When he does use the goggles again, he sees that the goat is gone. Where could it be? Oh, there it is. That's right, we're halfway through this movie, and that means it's time for the 
the main attraction, the motherfucking T-Rex. Oh my god, she looks so good. Gennaro runs out on the kids and into a nearby restroom to hide, and Malcolm gives them the benefit of the doubt. When you gotta go, you gotta go. The electric fence snaps behind them, and it's time for the money shot. Or should I say the T-Money shot, because here comes that Rex, baby. Give me that roll. <laughs> Grant tells Malcolm to be still because the T-Rex's vision is based on movement. That's a totally made up thing, but whatever, it's a movie. Too bad Lexi and Tim just decided to put Phantasmic on in their back seat. The T-Rex mistakes their Jeep for a cat toy and gets ready to cause them some T-Pain by smashing through the Jeep's glass ceiling in a terrifying display of how she's the true apex predator. As Malcolm and Grant gawk through their windshield, the T-Rex not only flips the Jeep over, but gets a mouthful of delicious tire. Mmm, rubber. The men finally decide to save the kids, so Grant gets out and distracts the T-Rex with a road Flair. Malcolm also wants to help, but he's a bit more foolhardy about it, leading the T-Rex on far too long until he winds up getting thrown through the air. The Rex accident knocks out Malcolm and destroys the glorified outhouse, leaving this hungry dinosaur to discover a free pot sticker in the form of Gennaro. With a mighty chomp, we get a classic kill. Gennaro eaten straight off the toilet. Grant fishes Lexi out from under the car, and when the T-Rex comes to sniffing, employs his patented don't you move a fucking muscle strategy to avoid his detection. The T-Rex gets pissy that it can't find its prey, so it forces them over a ledge and down a wall that shouldn't really exist there. Cause that's the broken electrical fence where the T-Rex stepped out from, and she had been standing on even ground. Where'd this giant cliff come from? But the Rex doesn't care about spatial logic and knocks the car over the edge, just barely missing Grant and Lexi in the process. Good job, girl. You should be so proud of yourself. Dennis Nedry is taking the off-roading capability of his Jeep a little too far when he winds up crashing it. Since the road is just down a bank, he tries to pull the car out with the winch cable, but runs into a few problems. The first of which is slipping down this natural water slide with a stupid stupid sound effect. <laughs> Then he runs into a Dilophosaurus, a cute little lizard boy who looks like the Machop of dinosaurs. Kinda small, but also straight jacked. This Machoposaurus has a few more fancy frills to it though, cause this fictional version of the species has the ability to hiss like a rattlesnake and spit out a bunch of poisonous tar onto Nedry's decolletage, then straight into his face. Blinded, Nedry bumps his head and drops his Barbasol can, losing his potential fortune. But not like he'd be able to use it anyway, cause that Dilophosaurus is waiting for him in the Jeep and gives us another kill by eating the duplicitous computer nerd in the front seat. Maybe she wouldn't have eaten you if you had said the magic word, Nedry. The jeep with Tim landed in a real tall tree, so Grant climbs up there and coaxes Tim's pukey ass out of the passenger seat while accidentally turning the wheel of the vehicle. They start to climb down when the jeep above them realizes, shit, I'm a car man, I ain't supposed to be in a tree like this, and tries to get its tires on more stable ground. We get a simple but exciting vertical chase through the tree that ends with Grant and Tim just barely lucking out when the car falls onto them sunroof first. Well, we're back in the car again. Muldoon and Sattler leave the others at the control station to go rescue everyone, and when they get to the T-Rex pen, they're able to find the tree jeep down below, along with evidence that Grant and the kids have already moved on. They also manage to find a sexy injured Malcolm, who's so badass he's already put a tourniquet on his leg. They load him into the jeep just in time for some more good vibrations, which are basically the entrance music for the T-Rex, so no big surprise when she busts out of the tree line and begins chasing them in the jeep. We must go faster. The T-Rex gets real close to them in a scene my film teacher would literally show every year to demonstrate how to make a kick-ass action sequence. Eventually, they outrun the Rex, who tries to play it off like she didn't even really want to eat them anyway. Yeah, keep telling yourself that, Rexy. Grant and the kids climb another tree and find themselves with box seat tickets to a Brachiosaurus show. Neat! Sounds like a great time for a cuddle party. Grant sleeps his way through some character development, and the next morning, they're visited by a Brachiosaurus eating breakfast. But poor girl must have a cold, because she sneezes all over Lexi, which is not what she was expecting. They make their way through the park and find some eggs out in the wild, confirming that these dinos have been doing some unsupervised supervised breeding, like many a rebellious teenager. Grant realizes that some West African frogs have been known to spontaneously change sex from male to female in a single sex environment. To put it more succinctly, life, uh, found a way. Hey, speaking of sexy ass Malcolm, here he is being sexy as hell. God damn, son! Since they can't break through Nedry's coding, Hammond wants to give the entire system a hard reboot. I see he's familiar with tech support solutions. Everyone holds onto their butts as Arnold hits the main switch, and although a computer says the system is working again, Arnold will have to go to a maintenance shed to get the lights and phones back on. Grant and the kids continue their unsupervised tour of the park when they run into a herd of Gallimimuses, Gallimimusai, who impress Grant with their bird-like behavior. The CGI used to render these animals similarly impressed Steven Spielberg, because it was only after seeing this scene done with computer animation that he decided to use more of it in his movie. The three of them escape a near trampling by hiding behind a log, from which they see a real Phalamimus when a T-Rex rushes out and eats one of the bird-like dinosaurs. And before you even comment, no, dinosaurs aren't going on the kill 
tail count. That shit would get way too difficult in the later movies. Arnold is taking too long to get back from his trip to the shed, so the power duo of Sattler and Muldoon step out to save the day again. Only this time, they're gonna have a Velosa problem on their hands, since it looks like those birds of prey have flown the coop. When they get near the shed, Muldoon realizes they're being stalked, so he goes off on a rapture hunt, while Ellie parkours her way through the jungle to get to the shed. Malcolm and Hammond use a schematic to direct her to the circuit breaker, but talk about bad timing. Granted, the kids have just reached an electric fence they'll have to climb. Of course, only after he gives them a little bit more trauma by pretending to get shocked by it. After they make their way over the top, Ellie gets the power charging up, causing the fences to warn them of a mighty big shock coming. But slow-ass motherfucking Tim just freezes in place instead of continuing to climb down, or jumping like a big brave boy. The power comes back on, and he gets his ass shocked right off the fence and into Grant's arms. Luckily, Grant is able to resuscitate the little firecracker and move on. With the lights all up and running again, it seems like nothing could possibly go wrong. Except for a raptor in the house! Yeah, it's finally time to see my favorite Jurassic Park dinosaurs in action. And right away, they score a kill when Ellie finds the detached arm of Mr. Arnold. If you don't recognize it, just try to picture a cigarette in its hand. Fun fact, Sam Jackson was gonna get a whole chase and death sequence until a real-life hurricane wiped out the set they needed. Bummer. Ellie manages to escape from the raptor in the maintenance shed and make her way to safety outside. But while Muldoon is on the hunt for the other two raptors, he underestimates their ability to trap him. Clever girl. Muldoon joins the kill count after one of the raptors jumps on him and noms him to death. Kinda looks like when Lucy plays too rough, only, you know, more murdery. Grant and the kids make it back to the visitor center, and he puts them in the dining area while he just about finishes his character growth. Big Tim, the human piece of toast. Hmm, growth is good, but maybe work on those jokes a little bit. He heads outside to look for the others, leaving the kids alone to eat all the jello pie they could want. While Grant and Sattler reunite outside, the kids get their fun time snack around ruined when an uninvited dinner guest shows up with a shadow puppet show. They run off to hide in the kitchen in yet another unforgettable sequence in a movie just chock full of them. Seriously, JP, give some other movies a chance to be this iconic. And since these raptors are Mensa members, they can open doors, so they step into the kitchen for a midday snack of kids. Hey, you know what's pretty cool? Some of these shots of the raptors are dudes wearing suits. I love it! The raptors make a mess and sniff around and get real close to finding Tim before Lexi distracts them with a ladle. Hey yo raptors, if you so smart, why are you smashing your face into a reflection, you big dummy? The kids manage to trick the other raptor into a freezer and lock her inside, then flee the kitchen as old smashy face recovers. Tim and Lexi join Ellie, Grant, and his shotgun, and together they all head to the control room to reboot the system and call for help. This scene is one of the movie's only missteps, just full of dumb character choices, as Grant and Ellie try to inefficiently keep a raptor out of the room while Tim dances around like he has to pee instead of being any use. Like, you know, by grabbing that gun off the ground. But since the computer is a Unix system and Lexi is elite hacker, she's able to navigate her way around the block fort map from Mario Kart and successfully reboot the system. The door locks, and with the phones online again, Grant calls Hammond requesting a pickup. But in no time at all, the raptor breaks into the room and chases them into the ceiling. They crawl through the air ducts until the raptor whack a moles his head up in there and nearly snaps up Lexi's stunt double, whose face was digitally replaced placed with Ariana Richards's when she looks up. They get her back up and make their way out to the main lobby of the visitor center, where the raptor's already waiting for them. History starts getting wrecked as they all swing around on various dino body parts and ride them like they're a bunch of bucking broncos at a bar. When they get too bucked up and wind up on the ground, the raptor from the maintenance shed joins the party, so now they've got two of these bastards yapping and snapping at them. Just when things look all but hopeless, the motherfucking T-Rex shows up, somehow without anyone noticing, and eats that raptor. Now there's a meal worthy of a Rex. While the raptor and Goliath fight goes down, the humans run outside, where Hammond is waiting for them in a jeep, finally willing to admit, yeah, okay, maybe I fucked up. They drive off, and the T-Rex finishes her fight inside, ending it with a mighty victory roar. <laughs> Dinosaurs! Our heroes board the last chopper out, and Hammond bids farewell to his disastrous murder part. The movie ends with Grant's character arc complete, since he's no longer repulsed by children, as he looks out the window at some birds, nature's living dinosaurs. It doesn't really matter how many people died, this is still one of the best movies ever, but since it's the conceit of the show, let's go ahead and get to the numbers. <laughs> Five people died in Jurassic Park, all of them dudes. And I hope you like the taste of blueberry pie, cause you about to get a lot of them in this series. With a runtime of 126 minutes, we wound up with a kill on average about every 25 minutes. I'll give the golden chainsaw for coolest kill to Donald Gennaro. Even if you've only seen this movie once, you remember the dude getting eaten off the toilet. Guaranteed. Doll machete for lamest kill will go to Joffrey, who died in a close-up on his hand. Why didn't anyone freaking shoot her? And for this franchise, I want to give one more award each movie. All of these films, the original and the 
the bad ones, have multiple amazing dinosaur sequences. So for each movie, I'm going to award a Diamond Dino, an award given to the most exciting or well-made sequence involving dinosaurs. For the original Jurassic Park, I'll give it to the T-Rex escaping from its paddock and attacking the visitors. The Rex looks absolutely incredible and scared many a small child who saw this movie, yours truly included. And the entire sequence just has non-stop thrills to it, from the Malcolm chase to the aforementioned toilet snack, even knocking the Jeep over that weirdly existent wall. It's all great. I love it. And that's it. Jurassic Park came out in 1993 and not only had a huge impact on the world of cinema, but also on me, your humble kill counter. And despite all its flaws, I was equally impacted by the first sequel, The Lost World Jurassic Park, which I'll be looking at next week. Until then, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill Count. Thanks a lot for watching this week's Kill Count. I want to thank a couple of patrons like Pickles McGee, Fleur Richardson, and Tyler Slom. Yes, the Jurassic Park movies are the new series on The Kill Count. But again, don't expect a Kill Count on Fallen Kingdom until it comes out on Blu-ray. I had so many Jurassic Park toys as a kid that this is really sad to me. I want those fences back, I want that RV, I want all that shit. Alright, be good people.